Welcome to the Pulse with Peter B. I'm your host, Peter Biancomano. Let's get you to the pulse on everything you need to know. And today's show is brought to you by The Dream Project. You can find out more information about our friends there at the link at the bottom of your screen. And stay tuned to the next segment because we're going to have a whole segment on them. Um, we're going to have Pavel Sokolov and Gabrielle Rossi in uh, talking about that wonderful, wonderful group. But speaking of wonderful, what, <laughs> the man to my right is Mr. Wonderful. Great and segue. That, there it is. Absolutely. <laughs> and that is our sports insider, Matt Wehmeyer. Matt, how are you today? I am thrilled to be back, and it's a dream project for me to be with you. Wow. I had to return the favor there. So. I, 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 he really did. I'm speechless. <laughs> I am speechless. Well, Matt, the calendar now says March. And that means? And what does that mean? Madness. Madness. Yes. Absolutely. We Absolutely. love the man, especially after, you know we're going two years now without March Madness, <laughs> so it's it's a welcome return for sure. It's the most wonderful time of year. It is opinion. for a sports fan. Yes, exactly. Yes. So why don't we uh, begin with a team that we you covered a lot last year, and mm -hmm. our friends at the Jersey Sports Report covered yes. immensely last year, and you were on there several times, and that is our Seton Hall Pirates. Yes. Um, much better team last year than uh, they were this year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, as of right now in the studio, it's three losses in a row. Of course, we're taping before the St. John's game, right. which is on Saturday evening, so it might be four. Yeah, let's hope not, What but could be. Besides Miles Powell being gone, Quincy McKnight being gone, Romero Gill being gone, yeah. this team started off pretty well. They what did. happened? Uh, you know, I, I think that it, it's weird because it, it was kind of a double-edged sword because, you know, their star player that's emerged with all the absences that you mentioned for last year, most notably Miles Powell, has been the best name in college sports, if not all of sports, Sandro Mamu Kalashvili. He has taken the star turn this year, and we you saw signs of it last year where you kind of looked at him and said, you know, he can be the guy. He can be the alpha male of this team when the other upperclassmen are gone. He's really going to take the reins and take over. He's done that. He's had a few... Big East Player of the Week accolades, uh, you know, throughout the season, well-deserved. But, again, here's where that double-edged sword comes in. He's been so good and so special that it's, at times, through no fault of his, stunted the development of the other players on the team because they kind of get in this mode of, of just standing and watching because, he's again, he's been so good, and there hasn't been that, that teamwork, that cohesion that we saw last year. Now, Miles Powell put up every bit the numbers last year right. that Sandro's putting up this year, but there was more of a team cohesion. There was more depth around Miles Powell, which they simply – haven't replaced, you know. I think we expected Iko Biagu to be the guy to be that that remaining twin tower with Romaro Gill last year to really shoulder the load, you know, in the paint. Not, you know, Sandro's a big guy. He's he's of that ilk too. But I think they needed him to be more of a traditional five, a traditional in the paint guy to really play defense, protect the rim. Sandro can get outside and shoot and really be that stretch four. Obiagu's done okay, but I don't think he's really filled the shoes of Romaro Gill, you know, right. from last year. Quincy McKnight, he was kind of the Swiss Army knife last year, the do-everything guy. They've really struggled to replace him. Jared Roden's had his moments. You know, the team has had their moments, but again, I think that the lack of depth around Sandro has really hurt them, and they started out great, but they, they've just gotten into this funk that they, they can't they snap can't out, of, out of, you know. Uh, back on uh, Wednesday night, you know, they lost at home in front of fans for the first time all year. Uh, to, I'm drawing a blank now, who do they UConn. lose to? UConn, thank you. <laughs> yes, a UConn team that is playing great under Danny Hurley. James, uh, James Booknight is back, and they really took it to Seton Hall on Wednesday night at the Prudential Center. This was a game where they finally got their fans back in attendance, and they thought that was going to be the elixir for what was uh, ailing them. Really didn't turn out to be the case. Uh, UConn went on a big run, stretching into the second half, 14-0 to kind of put the game away. And uh, if they don't get things fixed, and again, we're, we're talking before they take on, uh, you know, St. John's in the season finale, but if they don't write the ship before that game, it's really going to spell trouble for them. I, I completely agree. And you mentioned Jared Roden, and Jared Roden, you're right. He has, he has had bright spots. He's only a junior this year, looking forward to his senior year. But let's talk about these two senior guards that, of course, they're trying to fill Miles Powell's shoes, yeah. which is impossible. Yeah. And Quincy McKnight, that's uh, Miles Kale. And Shavar Reynolds Jr. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they are completely inconsistent. Jarrell Roden, I think, has run laps around the two of them this season. Yeah. And he's been inconsistent. Right, right. And, and there's your problem where, you know, right. when the guy that you're relying on is battling these inconsistencies, then, you know, if you're Kevin Willard, 
where do you turn? Right. You know, and, and again, a, a team's success or lack thereof goes beyond one star player. It went beyond Miles Powell last year. It goes beyond Sandro Mamu Kalashvili this year. Right. But again, you know, last year, I feel like we mentioned Quincy McKnight. You know, Kevin Willard could turn to him at any given moment and say, okay, Maybe Miles is off tonight. Miles needs a breather. You be the guy, and he was the guy. And he was the guy. Exactly. And they, they don't. They don't have that consistency uh, this year, and it's it's really hurt them. And the you know not that this is the the gospel or the Bible of college you know uh, basketball, but ESPN's bracketology is usually pretty reliable. And as of now, as we're sitting here now on a Thursday, uh, they've got Seton Hall as one of the first four out. So, Unbelievable. Yeah, so what is. do you think, Matt? What do you think? Let's say they go out, they beat St. John's mm -hmm. uh, on the road on Saturday evening. Um, and again, we're filming this Sunday, so let, let's say it does happen. How far do they need to get in the Big East tournament next week to make the tournament, to make the Ooh. NCAA tournament? Man, the that's that's a good question. I mean, they, they, it can't be one and done, obviously. Right. You know, I mean, I think that they've got to make a legitimate run to at least... Semifinals? At, I'd... Uh, Semifinals, I think, would solidify it for them. Agreed. I think if, if they reach the quarterfinals, that might get more votes, uh, you know, in their favor from the committee. But it's, I think it's at least quarterfinals, and they, if they reach the semis, then I, I think they'll be okay. Perfect. All right. Well, why don't we talk about a team, the other team in Jersey that's been like the laughing stock of sports for years and years and years when it comes to football and basketball. And of course, that's the Rucker Scarlet Knights. Um, Steve Peichel you doing a it. phenomenal job. <laughs> exactly. We were practicing that a we lot were. before the show. We were. Steve Peichel doing a phenomenal job in his fourth season. They look like they're definitely going to make the tournament, but also inconsistent. Yeah, they, they've, they've had kind of a weird year, too. I call them like the Jekyll and Hyde of the Big Ten because they started – Six and zero. Oh. Yeah, uh, they they had the preseason top twenty five ranking for the first time since I don't know what three decades or something at least. You know, mm -hmm. so you know they started off on a good foot. They started six and zero. Oh. They reached I believe number ten in the country. I mean everything was coming up Rutgers. Then they had kind of a weird loss uh, at Ohio State where. Uh, the game was, you know, neck and neck throughout the latter stages of the second half. And then Ohio State went on this ridiculous, I don't know, like 20 to nothing run to close out the game. And it just took the wind out of Rutgers sales for the for the next uh, ensuing couple of weeks. They came back home and they beat Purdue. So like, it looked like, okay, they've righted the ship. Then they lost five straight. At least, yeah. It was at least four, then I think it was five. Dropped out of the top 25. You know, they, they, got their, they got their groove back, got their mojo back, snuck back into the top 25 in recent weeks, and now a couple of losses again. You just don't know what, you, what you're going to get from them. I uh, mean, yeah, up and down. If they're one and done in the uh, Big Ten tournaments, they still might be an NCAA tournament team. I, I think they will because, you know, unlike Seton Hall, um, I, I don't recall if Seton Hall has had a top 25 ranking they this have year. No. So, and you would know. Exactly. Uh, right. Uh, not because has. I'm an alumni. No, nothing to do with it. <laughs> nothing at all. So, uh, in, you know, Rutgers has. Right? When, you, when you've got that pedigree of being a team that was considered before the season began one of the top 25 teams of the nation, you know, that certainly helps. Uh, right now, ESPN's got them as a 10 seed. So, it would take a, a cataclysmic collapse for them to completely fall uh, out of that field of 68. I think they're going to make it, but a few wins of the Big Ten tournament wouldn't hurt. Well, I want to see both of our Jersey teams in I there. Do what too. do you think? I, do too. I mean, right? Come on. We yeah. haven't had that type of uh, tournament. That, that, uh, both teams in a tournament in a very long time. In a very long time. <laughs> exactly. I, you know, I, think, I think Rutgers gets in. I think, you know, if Kevin Willard lights a fire under his guys, you know, I, I like both Jersey teams getting in, but Seton Hall clearly has more work to do. Definitely. Well, Matt Wehmeyer, so good to see you. So good to see you. I mean, we're, you're going to be back because it's March. That's right. And the madness is here. The madness is here. It ain't going away. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you for joining us again, and we Got look forward much. to seeing you. Uh, later in the future folks we will be right back peter biancomano your hostess with the mostest of the pulse with peter b folks don't forget to go on our facebook and our instagram pages by searching the pulse with peter b and like and follow us on each of those platforms we're constantly updating those pages with previews of each week's segments and cool stories. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to our email address at thepulsewithpeterv at gmail.com. Welcome back to The Pulse. I'm guest host Pavel Sokolov here with Executive Director of The Dream Project, Gabrielle Rossi. 
Gabrielle, can you tell us more about the Dream Project? Yeah, absolutely. So the Dream Project is a nonprofit organization that gives uh, students, undergraduate college students, the opportunity to do good in their own communities. So they commit to a year of hands-on fundraising and volunteer work before biking across the country in the name of their cause. So it's about understanding that we can all make a difference in our communities. We don't need to have a huge net worth. We don't need to be uh, tenured in our career and have a big network. It's really about understanding that at any point we can uh, make a difference. And, and I think that's a, a mission that is important now more so than ever. That's very admirable. Could you tell us some background and history? What inspired you to get involved? Yeah, absolutely. So the Dream Project started uh, in 2013 when a group of my friends and I decided uh, to bike across the country. We wanted to support a local organization that supported pediatric cancer patients. And of course, um, the logical explanation of how to do so would be biking across the country made to uh, total sense. And it, it was an absolutely wonderful uh, experience. It was very much a fly by the seat of our pants kind of experience, but it was very uh, transformative for me because it really opened up my eyes to this idea that I can do really cool things that make a difference in my community. And you know, we were able to raise tens of thousands of dollars. We volunteered uh, with organizations across the country who are all working towards making the lives better of patients uh, with pediatric cancer and the families that support them. And so I wanted to create a structure that allowed uh, students at this really transformative point in their life where they're trying to figure out you know, who they are and how they can contribute to the world around them, the same space to really um, you know, grow into this capacity as leaders and um, members of their community. From my understanding, not only do the students fundraise throughout the bike ride itself, but they also do service projects in different communities. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's all about understanding that there are these big weighty missions that are challenging organizations across the country and across the world. And so my students might not you know, solve um, food insecurity in one academic calendar, but they can make a lot of inroads in understanding how we're all working to feed our neighbors. So if an a uh, team is supporting a community kitchen here in New Jersey, and they're learning from them and raising money on their behalf over the course of the school year. When they take off across the country, they'll volunteer with community kitchens, food banks, um, urban gardens, who are all working to address this big weighty issue in their own way. And in that sense, it doesn't matter if a small town in Wisconsin has never heard of um, a community kitchen here in New Jersey because they understand the work that they're doing and it's a the, the very universal mission and understanding. So due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I understand that it wasn't possible to have an organized bike ride this year. Uh, were you doing something in the same vein uh, to fundraise or to keep the message alive? It's a great question. <laughs> it's still a little bit up in the air. Of course, safety is of paramount concern. Biking across the country, even in the best of circumstances, is not without its uh, physical challenges. And it, it doesn't matter at the end of the day how much money we raise or how many miles anyone rides. I just want everyone to come home safe. And that stands true uh, now more so than ever. And so in that spirit, we are working on a more contained Dreaming of New Jersey ride for this July and August, in which the riders will tackle all 21 counties of our wonderful state. Uh, and they'll volunteer every day with a different organization in a different town working to get our neighbors up on their feet. So they'll be working with uh, community kitchens, food shelters, um, housing organizations, social services organizations, all working to provide basic needs. And so it might not be the grand <laughs> adventure that we all had in store, but I think the spirit of the organization is doing good and, and doing good in ways that are transformative and impacting and long lasting. And I think the most good we can do right now is right here in our home state. It's wonderful to hear that the spirit of charity and giving is still alive during these tough times. Yeah. And on that note, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the charitable organizations that you partner and fundraise for? Yes, absolutely. So every year the students get to decide what uh, organization or, or what cause they want to support. And so we've had the honor of working with really wonderful organizations. Uh, most recently, we've worked with the Embrace Kids Foundation. Uh, we have worked with Visions and Pathways. We've worked with Elijah's Promise. And this year, 
uh, we are working with Triple C Housing. And so Triple C Housing does really incredible work. They work to find permanent housing solutions and provide social services to uh, vulnerable communities across the state of New Jersey. So they have uh, collaborative housing facilities all across the state in which people are given um, a permanent place to stay. These are not through shelters and the services and the support they need to get back on their feet. And so we've been working with Triple C. Uh, this is our second year. Things uh, got a little interrupted last year. And we've gotten creative with how we support uh, the members of the Triple C community. We've done virtual events. We built a composting bin in the fall. And uh, once the ground thaws out a little bit, we're going to start a community garden in one of the houses. We've done um, letter writing campaigns. We've sent them holiday cards and Valentine's Day cards. And it's really been such a, a warm and collaborative partnership and one that um, we are so grateful. I, I think the really important thing to understand is when we partner with organizations, we don't go in, um, and this is something I really stress with the students, to prescribe best practices. We're very much there to learn and understand how people in our community are tirelessly working day in and day out to solve really, really weighty challenges that um, we certainly don't know the best uh, answer to, but how can we play uh, an empathetic part in thoughtfully furthering that mission? And so I've personally learned so much from Triple C and all the charities that we've worked with over the years and, and look forward to continuing that education. Uh, building off on that, not only as a founding writer, not only as a founding writer, but also now as executive director, what is a major takeaway from the experiences you've had? Oh, there's so many. I think uh, the fact that this organization is, is built on a network of strangers. And so every year, you know, communities and, and families um, open up their homes and support Dream Riders because they applaud their mission. And so they've never met these students, but every year they you know, bike through their town and they, uh, they pull out the metaphorical and sometimes literal red carpet and I think that spirit and that faith in humanity is something that I am continuously overwhelmingly grateful for and that none of this would be possible without the, the community of people who stand by this organization because they applaud the compassion of the students who commit to these endeavors. So how would someone who wants to get involved to give back uh, be a part of the Dream Project? Great question. So. You can always go to our website, thedream.bike, where you'll find more information about what this summer will look like as soon as we figure that out, um, how to get involved, to sign up for our newsletters, to hear from our students, and to donate to our causes. You know, this year is really, again, supposed to be a celebration of the people and the places in our state. And so the plan is to do big community rides every weekend in July where we tackle a different uh, signature location within New Jersey and, and really celebrate all that the Garden State has to offer and how we can collectively work as a community to, to give back. And so all of that will be on our website, thedream.bike. I'm sure the people of New Jersey will be really thankful for your efforts. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We'll be you. right back. Peter Biancomano back with you. Don't forget to watch us on cable access every Sunday and Monday at 9 a.m. Optimum Channel 18, Files Channel 46, and Comcast Channel 190. Also on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m., you can watch our show on our YouTube channel, and you can also binge watch all of our old shows. Who doesn't want to keep watching The Pulse of Peter Bay? We'll see you there. Welcome back. I'm your guest host with the most, Josh Sotomayor Einstein, filling in for Peter Biancomano. I know maybe you don't recognize me with my mask right now, uh, but I'm usually the resident political analyst. Happy to be here today with Erica Seitzman. How are you doing? Hi, welcome. Thank you for having me. So you're joining us today to talk about all the different volunteer opportunities uh, and different charities that exist in, in the Mile Square City. Am I right? Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about uh, about yourself and your volunteering and what organizations that you're involved in. So a little bit about me. I have been volunteering since I've been five. 
And Hoboken has so many amazing organizations that basically anything you can think of. Organizations that are close to my heart are the Hoboken Shelter, the Hoboken Volunteer Ambulance Corps, True Mentors, Moms Demand Action, Community Lifestyles, In Jesus' Name, the Hoboken Food Pantry. You know, we can go on all day. So just to be clear, in Jesus' Name is the name of the food pantry. Am I yes. correct? Yeah, I've been there a couple of times. Um, and for some reason, they always think that I am a high school kid, even though I have a ton of gray hairs. But I'm usually <laughs> wearing a hat as I am right now. So I guess I should be complimented. Yes, that's April Harris. She has been helping our neighbors, our friends and neighbors for about almost 40 years now. Amazing woman, part of the um, OLG, the church oh, here so on Clinton Street. Our Lady of Grace, right? Yes. So the, the food pantry, the food bank is actually on the campus of Our Lady of Grace. Yes. Oh, very nice, very nice. And how long have you been involved with the, uh, with the soup kitchen? With the various soup kitchens, uh, I've been Hoboken <clears throat> almost two decades, so I've probably been involved with most of these places for about 15 years. Okay. Well, you said the various soup kitchens, but to my knowledge, there's only one soup kitchen in town, or maybe there's two, St. So Matthews or something there's, like that? Uh, there's actually more than that. So no let's, you want to break it down? Break it down. Let's break it down. So we have, most people know when you think of feeding people before the pandemic, you would think of the Hoboken Shelter. So the Hoboken Shelter services 500, we serve, they serve 500 meals a day and they sleep over 50 people each night. And anybody that needs food can come in and um, be serviced. On top of that, then you have in Jesus's name, Food Pantry, which services um, lots of families all across Hudson County. People, it's a by appointment only with April Harris. But the Food Pantry or bank, that's not hot meals. That's more like uh, to go, like okay. to go. Then it's more like cans and, yes. and, and food that's packaged. Absolutely. And then you also have St. Matthew's Trinity who does breakfast, the lunchtime ministry. And now we even have the Hoboken Community Center, which started as part of the Y, the HCC. They started last year, part of the pandemic, and they service, I have to think of the get the numbers, but a lots of people. And we want everybody to understand that no matter where you live in town, no matter what you did before 2020, anybody that needs food assistance here in Hoboken, please ask. Because everybody automatically assumes that it's only for people that um, need a little extra help. But sometimes now it's 2020, 2021, a lot of people need a little extra help and we don't want them to be shy. We want them to come forward and say, it's okay. We are, we are here to help. We are here to serve. Well, I mean, you've definitely been serving a lot. I know, what was it last year that the, uh, the, the homeless shelter recognized you at their annual gala or was it two years ago? That was almost four years ago. Four years ago. Well, yes. time flies, ladies and gentlemen, time flies. But still, you're, you're, you know, you're a regular fixture there. I know I've gone there a couple of times. I know I've gone to the, uh, the food bank a couple of times, uh, and everyone always speaks highly of your volunteerism. Are there, is there any nonprofits that you know of that you've worked with that deal with students, not just, you know, not just the, uh, um, the free range uh, population, but uh, with, with youngsters? So there are a lot of organizations that deal with students. What aspects do you, are you talking about homework help? Are you talking about giving them a little Anything extra Anything that boost? you're involved with. So there are a lot of organizations in town that specifically deal with our youth. One would be um, True Mentors. They do homework help. They do mentoring. They have a special teen program. It's run by this woman, Catherine, who does an amazing job. Another organization is Community Lifestyles. They do some similar projects. They do a summer camp as well as they're starting a flag football program as well. And there's tons of other organizations that actually the Hoboken school system has lots of activities and ways to really help their students, the population as well. Very, very nice. And what is your favorite nonprofit that you volunteered with? Or what's a, what's a touching story? Maybe I won't have you rank them because then you Ooh, might not be you might not be invited back to, right. to, to, to participate. But what, what's your most touching story of volunteering in Hoboken? Oh, that's hard. I think that would have to be two years ago. I, t I teach at the United Synagogue of Hoboken. And we took a bunch of teens to the shelter. And while we were there, we were talking to the guests. We called them guests. Everybody's a guest. It's important to get people eye recognition and people to feel um, connected and important and not just like they're homeless people. They don't count. Everybody counts. We want everybody counts no matter who you are, no matter where you are, everybody counts. 
And one of the students uh, noticed was talking to a gentleman and noticed that his bike wasn't um, was a need to be fixed, so he could be an Uber driver, to, an Uber a bike driver to get mm -hmm. like Uber Eats. You're Uber saying. Eats, yes. Okay. And through this whole process, we were able to um, facilitate to get his bike back, and we showed the students that together, with a little, the little love, we could help somebody who wanted to be helped and who wanted to have a better opportunity and was really wanted to work and was had a stumbling block. And I think people sometimes hit stumbling blocks. And sometimes you need to ask some your friends and family for a little extra love. And sometimes it's hard. And sometimes people have a little harder stories than others. But the amazing thing about Hoboken, if you ever see, I do this, I am one of the, the social media people for the shelter. And if you ever see the hashtag, it says community, I do hashtag community love because Hoboken, no other small town in the world has community love. I can come on and ask for toilet paper. I can ask for whatever the, the need is right now. And the neighbor, everybody will, they will rise to the occasion and produce, if not more. And I think now, looking back, if we can talk about COVID in 2020 a bit, if you're a community helper like myself, you never could imagine having to help this many people. And now we have to get creative. So you still have to help the, 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 the shelter and, and all of these and feed people. But what about happens to our friends who lost their jobs at the local businesses oh, and the restaurants? Very, very tough times, in the, especially in the service uh, economy, the service industry. So now you have to try to help both. And the, we, the frontline uh, front appreciation group did that through the entire time. Uh, Hoboken, there's a realtor group with the KW Red Day. They came through with flying colors to work with the local businesses like Court Street and Mile Square Cafe to really to provide dinner for the, the shelter. So that's a win-win because you're keeping people in business. You're also helping your friends in need. And the Hoboken Family Alliance has a new program. They call it Takeout Tuesday, I believe. And they are asking people to purchase gift cards from their local restaurant. And they will then provide it to individuals who have been affected by COVID. Well, that sounds absolutely delicious. And it's a nice thing to do. Uh, it sounds like, you know, you're on top of volunteerism in the Hoboken community from the top to the bottom on on every level uh, from dedicating your, your time and your effort, uh, you know, and putting your money where your mouth is as well. So definitely really appreciate you coming on the, the, the Pulse with Peter B, uh, which will soon be renamed the Einstein Hour. Uh, and uh, sharing with us all the different ways people can be involved in, uh, in our, our Mile Square community. Thank you so much. Thank you. This episode was brought to you by The Dream Project. To find out more about that wonderful nonprofit, check out the link below. And don't forget to tune in next week for everything you need to know on The Pulse with Peter B. The Pulse with Peter B. is a proud partner of Eyes on NJ. Peter Biancomano, your hostess with the mostest of The Pulse with Peter B. Folks, don't forget to go on our Facebook and our Instagram pages by searching The Pulse with Peter B. And like and follow us on each of those platforms. We're constantly updating those pages with previews of each week's segments and cool stories. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to our email address at thepulsewithpeterb at gmail.com. 